order. The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister for Employment and Learning. And we will start with list, listed questions. I have to tell you questions 1, 3 and 13 have been withdrawn. And I call Mr Jonathan Craig, who is not in his place. I therefore move on. Question 3, as I say, has also been withdrawn. I call Ms Rosalind McCorley, who is not in her place. I call Mr Barry Michael Duff who is not in his place. I call Mrs Judith Cochran, who is not in her place. I call Mr George Robinson, who is in his place. <laughs> Question 7, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the member for his question and his attendance to uh, uh, ask the question as well? Uh, my department devotes considerable resources to developing relationships with current and potential employers in the North West and to meeting their skill needs, both short and long term. My department has funded a liaison officer for employment and skills in Derry. A wide range of interfaces are available, helping businesses and individuals access support to, to, to develop their skills. The Career Service, Jobs and Benefit Offices and the Skills Solution Service act in various ways as portals to skills development. North West Regional College and the, the University of Ulster are focused on providing businesses with, skill, with the skilled people ready to avail of employment opportunities. The practical outworking of this approach is seen, for example, in response to the local ICT sector's demand for new talent. I announced recently a pilot ICT apprenticeship scheme to recruit individuals into this growing sector in the North West. This development seeks to build on positive results from a similar project in Belfast, which has seen 74 ICT apprentices recruited. At present, my department has a commitment from seven organisations, including Seagate, 360 Productions and, and Alley Cats, to take on a total of 11 apprentices. Working with InvestNI, the Assured Skills Programme is designed to attract foreign direct investment companies to Northern Ireland by assuring them that the skills they need are available. Assured Skills support is also available to encourage existing companies considering expansion. In September 2014, the second cohort of the Software Professional course will be offered in the North West. This is a Northern Ireland-wide initiative which will see 250 non-ICT graduates upskilled to allow them to work proficiently in ICT roles. Mr. Robinson for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his very detailed answer as well? Um, can I ask the Minister, uh, would he undertake to ensure that emphasis is placed on emerging technologies, as this will be a growing and valuable asset for students in the future labour market, particularly those in the North West, <coughs> where we have lost so many jobs in the last few years? Uh, I very much endorse the comments that the, the member uh, has made. We are we're well aware of the potential for growth in the, in the Northern Ireland economy as a whole uh, over the, the, the coming decade. And we're also equally aware that uh, there's potential in a number of, of uh, key sectors, and that includes the ICT uh, sector. Already the North West has a presence uh, in this regard, uh, and obviously uh, Seagate is a, is a major employer uh, in, in that part of the world, um, and indeed is, is a major asset to, to uh, Northern Ireland, one that is seeking to, to uh, further uh, entrench its position within our, within our economy and, and to develop its research and development uh, capacity. There are other companies as well, and it is important that uh, our colleges and universities uh, respond uh, to this challenge, and we are investing heavily in additional places uh, to facilitate this. I'm also keen to highlight the importance of higher level apprenticeships as a, mean to, a means to address the needs of the ICT sector. And that, that's why I was so keen to make reference to the fact that we are uh, developing pilots specifically in the North West in that regard. Mr. Kakalawashi. Good morning. I'm going to asking, uh, thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can I ask the Minister what opportunities he, he sees for retraining of those employees at the DVA offices in Korean? Well, well, first of all, with reference to, to that, um, there is the potential for the, re the reallocation of staff uh, elsewhere within uh, the public sector, and there are efforts underway um, out with my own direct responsibilities um, in, in that regard. Um, we will always seek to respond to the needs of individuals and to um, employers in a, in a more general sense, uh, and we will be mindful uh, in the event uh, of people uh, being redundant as to how we can facilitate them uh, in terms of, of retraining. 
training. Um, obviously, we want to take note of opportunities that are existing elsewhere in the economy and to, to work in terms of good careers advice to see uh, how those skills can be transferred and indeed what additional programmes, if appropriate, uh, can be put in place to help uh, people in that situation. Well, Mr Joe Byrne. Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister outline what tracking system is in place to keep a record of those that are not on employment, training or education, and what progress has been made in relation to trying to develop a rural university, rural university network for the West, as maybe the South West College could help them? Um, th those are probably two questions that are slightly um, off, off topic, uh, but um, no nonetheless, with reference to uh, the tracking system for NEETS, uh, we are developing a unique, unique learner number uh, in, in that regard, uh, which in the first instance will allow individuals to be better tracked uh, within uh, programmes that my own department uh, currently offers. Uh, in due course, we want to see that as something that can be applied right across the education system, including uh, our schools. And that way, we will be able to much better uh, map uh, progression uh, for our young people. With reference to the second point the member makes in relation to a rural uh, university, as he describes it, uh, one of the projects uh, within the higher education strategy, um, Project 10, uh, is designed to facilitate um, a university centre uh, within uh, the, the FE uh, offering across Northern Ireland. Um, both South West College and Southern Regional College have expressed interests uh, in this regard, and uh, my officials are in discussions with them uh, to see how we can develop a model uh, that would provide um, more ready access to university courses in rural settings within Northern Ireland. Well, Mr Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Future investors in the North West will certainly be focused around Project Kelvin and also the new Enterprise Zone in Cold Rain. Will the Minister's Department be able to react quick enough to ensure the skill set is in place for future young people to meet those job demands? Again, I thank the member for his question. There's always a, a trade-off uh, to be struck between what you would term um, spectral training in, in anticipation um, of uh, jobs that may be created in due course and then responding uh, to situations as, as we find them. If we jump too early and, and sometimes get it wrong, there is always a danger of criticism coming uh, from um, MLAs and indeed uh, from the, the, the Audit Office uh, in relation to, to the inefficient use of public resources. If we leave things too late, uh, then there's always a danger of missing out on opportunities and not fully developing opportunities that, that may arise. Nonetheless, we are very mindful that the ICT sector is a sure bet in, in this regard. Uh, we have seen evidence of, of significant growth in the past number of years. The projections are that that is set to grow uh, even, even faster uh, over, over coming years, and particularly in the context of a lower level of corporation tax. And that's why we're placing such emphasis upon growing the number of university places, uh, developing a higher level of apprenticeships um, in ICT, and also the provision of the the, the conversion courses uh, for non-IT uh, graduates uh, to transfer uh, and uh, to have very lucrative careers in a, a very important sector for our economy. Call Mr. Alex Maskey for a question. Carmagat, last night, Kula, cast over a hot question number eight, please. Uh, during our most recent meeting, I discussed with Minister Quinn a number of areas where there could be greater uh, cross-border collaboration. We discussed the issue of student flows. And whilst recognising that a growth in student mobility in general is beneficial, we noted that there are current imbalances that do need to be addressed. My officials are currently working with colleagues in the South on a study researching student flows. It was agreed that there is a particular issue with further education in the Derry and Donegal area, which requires particular attention. It would appear that a lack of, uh, of provision at certain levels in Donegal may be a contributing factor. We agree that my officials uh, will collate and share uh, relevant information with our counterparts in the Department of Education and Skills as a first step and will explore ways to address the imbalance, including looking at alternative funding opportunities. Work to address potential barriers to higher education student mobility in both directions is being taken forward and a system is now in place to address the financial need, needs of students. The issue of A-level equivalences is a contributing factor to the low number of Northern Ireland students considering higher education in the South. The Irish Universities Association continues to consider the position at a strategic level. However, a number of universities are considering interim measures to attract Northern Ireland students. 
Rory Quinn and I have agreed that, that an interim paper on cross-border further education issues should be prepared for consideration by ministers in a north-south ministerial context in June. I will continue to meet with Minister Quinn in the future to discuss progress on these issues, and my officials will continue to work closely with our counterparts in the south on these and other cross-border issues. Well, Mr. Maskey for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for his response so far. Could I ask the Minister, has he given any consideration or had made any assessment uh, of the opportunities presented by the Magalhães Scholarships uh, at DCU uh, for encouraging uh, more students from the north here travelling for, for their education in the south? Uh, I thank the member for a supplementary. I would uh, very much welcome uh, the initiative uh, of the, the Magalhães uh, Scholarships. Uh, and what we are seeing uh, at present is, in the absence of a, of a formal uh, policy approach across the board uh, from the Irish Universities Association, we are seeing indiv individual universities take an action themselves uh, to progress uh, this issue. Um, I, think, I think a number are conscious that they have uh, very few uh, students coming from, from Northern Ireland. Uh, and in particular, the existing ones that do go do tend to concentrate in Dublin. Uh, and by implication, you'll find that some of the other universities have very, very small numbers of students uh, from, from Northern Ireland. Um, so the McAleese uh, scholarships are an important um, initiative. They also send a wider signal uh, to the rest of the sector. And they also reflect some of the good work that's also happening in Trinity and at University College Galway in this regard too. Well, Mr Gregory Campbell for supplementary. As the economies in both countries, both Northern Ireland and the Republic, pick up at different levels, uh, what a communication and discussion is the Minister going to have with this counterpart in the Irish Republic so that if there is a particular skill set that is being deployed here but the jobs aren't here at the moment but would be, for example, in the Irish Republic in the Greater Dublin area, that more, is, uh, more advantage is taken of the skills base that we have here while the employment might be actually required in the Republic? I uh, thank the member uh, for his question. And indeed, we have uh, discussed the issue both in terms of uh, utilising existing skills bases um, and also how we can uh, develop uh, further specialisms uh, on either across border or all island bases uh, to facilitate the creation of jobs uh, in both uh, jurisdictions. Um, we are living in a, in a fast changing uh, economic uh, situation. We also know that the, the, the level of development um, and cooperation in these matters uh, across the border uh, is probably uh, seriously underdeveloped. Um, the same applies, for example, in terms of, of research, uh, where there is considerable potential for collaboration between northern and southern uh, universities. I'm hopeful that um, the, the, the pilot, uh, sorry, the, the, sorry, the groundbreaking um, announcement that we made in December uh, in relation uh, to uh, cooperation on a north-south basis and research will provide us a platform in this regard. We also need to be looking proactively uh, in relation to Horizon uh, 2020 and uh, a good foundation in terms of collaboration is important to access bids uh, in, in that regard. So there's a lot that we can do to the benefit of each of our economies uh, through collaboration both in terms of skills and research. Mr. Danny Kinahan. Thank you very much, um, Deputy Speaker. And may I ask the, the, the Minister, on, in light of what he's just been telling us, what linkage or grouping of people does he take with him when he goes to these meetings, and how much of the Department of Education does it include, and how often do you meet with the Minister and link so that it's not just you talking to the Education and Skills Minister, but it's also including our own Education Minister? Well, um, the, the, as a member will appreciate, um, my department is not part of the formal uh, north-south uh, uh, ministerial structures. There is a wider uh, debate uh, to be had uh, in relation uh, to, to those which has been uh, out there for uh, quite some time. Um, regardless of the particular structures, uh, I am more than happy uh, to further uh, collaboration uh, on a north-south basis, on a, on a bilateral basis with, with my colleague. Um, meetings happen um, on, on a frequent basis uh, at ministerial level and also at official level, and officials will meet, uh, including at a senior level, on, on, a, on a frequent basis. Um, I do compare notes uh, with uh, my colleague, the Minister of Education, John, John O'Dowd, and indeed the, the last meeting we had with, with Ruri Quinn uh, coincided with a more formal uh, meeting that John O'Dowd was also having uh, with, with Ruri Quinn, so we are all in the, in the same building at the same time. Mr. Patsy McGlone for a question. Uh, question number nine. 
Uh, since May 2011, my, my department and its non-departmental public bodies have spent a total of 420,000 on consultancy fees up to the 31st of December 2013. This level of expenditure is approximately 0.02% of the department's annual resource budget. Of this, 57%, or 240,000, uh, relates to expenditure by the department, and 43%, 179,000, relates to expenditure incurred by the, uh, by the non-departmental public bodies. Mr. McGlone for supplementary. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his comprehensive response and his percentages as well. Um, could I ask the Minister just what he's doing to limit this cost, given the future departmental expenditure limits being imposed? Well, uh, the, the member is probably aware that uh, executive-wide there are new uh, protocols or protocols that have been in place for um, a, a number uh, of months, if not longer, uh, in relation to the authorisation um, of consultancy. So there are more checks and balances uh, in relation uh, to, to all of this. But what I, I would stress is that uh, consultancy needs to be considered uh, on its own merits in terms of each uh, individual uh, case. Um, at times, the use of consultants can be of benefit uh, to ensure that we have a much more robust foundation in terms of uh, policy making. Uh, if we get things right in terms of policy making, that will ensure down the line that we are much more efficient in terms of the use uh, of other resources uh, and the public stands to benefit uh, from that. At times I do appreciate that people can be somewhat cynical uh, about the use uh, of, of consultancy, uh, but I think if people do step back and look at some individual cases, they will see that it does make a, a real difference uh, to outcomes. Call Mr May Nesbitt for supplementary. Deputy Speaker, thank you very much indeed, and I thank the Minister for, for his uh, answers to date. Does the Minister take a view as to whether he thinks it is better in terms of the employment of external consultants to do it on a tender basis uh, or whether he would prefer a contractual relationship of, of the sort of nature that the Strategic Investment Board uh, has recently developed with their external consultants? Well, I, I thank the member for his question. I suspect he's trying to lead me down a certain uh, direction, direction of travel. But let me, let me say and address it in, in this way. Um, again, a, a decision has to be made in terms of the particular area as to what is the most appropriate means by which uh, one would engage consultants. Um, normally, it is through uh, a, a tender process. Um, occasionally, um, there may well be very strong uh, reasons uh, for engaging in a single tender action. Uh, if you are looking for a particular uh, set of expertise uh, that has, has been identified. But it's very much horses for courses, uh, and it is incumbent upon um, senior officials in departments and ultimately ministers uh, to ensure that uh, proper consideration is given uh, to uh, value for money and that uh, there is a strong business case and rationale uh, for the employment of consultants. Call Mr. Pat Ramsey for a question. Question to him, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I wish to group uh, questions 10 and 12 uh, and would like uh, to request an additional minute to answer. Uh, my department provides a range of programmes, services, advice and guidance to assist people with a full range of disabilities, including young people who are diagnosed with autism. The Career Service has partnership agreements in place with, with post-primary schools, including special schools. These agreements allow careers advisors, in consultation with schools, the opportunity to help people to realise their career aspirations and to achieve their full potential in education, training and employment. This includes those with autism. The Department's Training for Success programme is one option that is considered by the careers advisor at this stage, but only after a parental or guardian consent. Should this be the case, the young person will be referred to a disability support provider. This process aims to ensure that, that specific learning and development supports needs are identified and put in place as soon as possible after commencement of training. My Department's Disability Employment Service also has a number of specialist disability employment programmes, including Work Connect, Access to Work and Workable. Through these programmes and in conjunction with the local disability sector, the Department provides valuable support to people with autism who are, who are looking to find and to retain employment. The programmes are also a means to encourage employers to provide opportunities for people with autism to engage in work. Work Connect and Workable are delivered by a strong consortium of disability organisations that uh, support employment solutions. This includes the Orchardville Society and now two local organisations which specialise in helping and supporting people with autism and Asperger uh, syndrome. 
These two organisations have worked in partnership to deliver Project ABLE, the Autism Building Links to Employment Initiative, which was funded through the Big Lottery until this year. My officials have very good working relationships with the respective organisations. Through its European unit and the Disability Employment Service, my department currently provides financial support to enable both organisations to deliver similar projects under the auspices of the European Social Fund. With the next call for the European Social Fund applications due in the autumn of 2014, I am confident that my department will continue to work with and support these organisations and others who deliver employment services to people with disabilities, including those that specialise in helping people with autism progress towards and move into the world of work. I would hope that my department's financial commitments will be augmented with match funding from other public bodies, as this must be a collective effort on behalf of all of those who have signed up to the autism strategy. We are also currently devising a disability employment strategy for Northern Ireland, which we will, we will consult on later on this year. Mr Ramsey, <coughs> for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the very detailed uh, response to, to my question. Could I ask the Minister, in light of the fact that it is generally known that someone with a learning disability is four times less likely to secure work in Northern Ireland, you know, what efforts are being made or motivation with the parents of children with autism? to prepare them for the workplace, to help and assist them? Well, I, I thank the, the member uh, for his question and also um, acknowledge his uh, long-standing interest uh, in campaigning uh, in, in this area. I think, first of all, it is important that we acknowledge the role of parents uh, as key advisors in terms of, of future uh, decision-making. And uh, careers uh, advice, particularly for those uh, making transitions, is currently available. It's something we're, we're further uh, re uh, reviewing as part of the wider uh, careers review that we launched um, at, at, the end, uh, of, of, uh, at the end of March this year. Um, it's also important that we encourage employers to offer op opportunities uh, for people uh, with a range of, of disabilities. It's important that we, we stress that many people with disabilities can play a full and active role uh, in the workplace. And in particular, um, with reference to autism, uh, there are many people with autism who can actually play an enhanced role in the workplace. Uh, they often bring enhanced employability skills in, ter in terms of um, things like attention to detail, uh, reliability, punctuality, uh, and a, a, a very tight attention uh, to, to the work. And uh, a lot of testimonials from employers ha have stressed uh, the real added value that has been found from employing people uh, with, with autism. Uh, it's important that that message is further passed on right across um, employers in Northern Ireland and that we do encourage more to step forward and that will be one of the key components within the forthcoming disability employment strategy. Uh, Mrs Pam Cameron would have been called for supplementary but she's not in her place. I call Mr Sammy Douglas. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Um, the Minister would be aware of just the difficulties that young people in particular who have um, autism experience when they leave school and particularly in terms of job creation, trying to get a job. Um, would, a bit, when it's, would the minister be a, um, give us an up-to-date uh, rough idea of the percentage of young people who are unemployed who have autism, uh, uh, Asperger's autism um, syndrome? And secondly, would he be willing to maybe visit some of those groups in East Belfast who work with young people? Well, I can't give the member a precise figure off the top of my head, off my head though people will be aware of the general profile of autism amongst young people in general, but we can't take it as read that that figure will be higher amongst the subsection of those young people who are unemployed, hence the importance of work in this area to ensure that we are offering opportunities and indeed fully utilising the skills of those young people. Um, in terms of activity in East Belfast, I would perhaps highlight uh, to the member um, the, the, the new intervention from uh, Specialistern, um, which uh, was launched in the Skenos Centre on the, the 9th uh, of April. Uh, they are very much uh, working uh, with young people uh, to create opportunities in the ICT sector, and it is one of those areas where uh, people with autism have a very particular aptitude and ability to make a real out of value uh, to, to the world of work. Uh, a number of the other projects uh, and, and organisations that are previously mentioned uh, also um, would be working in, in East Belfast as, as, as alongside other places in Northern Ireland. So we do have a good footprint in terms of the community and, and voluntary sector. And what's important is that they come forward with good projects and in turn the government uh, looks to support them into the future. 
Call Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In the Minister's answer, he made much reference to the use of the European Social Fund. Has his department anything in place should they fail to be successful in that funding, or even again, should they be in a position that they couldn't apply to the European Social Fund, maybe if we were no longer a part of Europe? Well, um, I, would, I would hate to think that we wouldn't be um, part of Europe and uh, that we would lose the advantage um, that does accrue to us uh, from access to, to the European Social Fund alongside CAP and uh, a host of other uh, structural funds as well and the competitive funds. It goes on and on and on. Um, but uh, in terms of the, the specifics uh, of, of this, um, I, I, it is important that um, organisations do put uh, proper attention into their bids for the European Social Fund. It is a competitive uh, process, and organisations will be scored ag against each other in terms of what is a fixed budget. However, that budget will uh, be, be at the very least at the same scale as in previous uh, rounds, uh, and uh, so that there is a wealth of opportunities um, out there. In the event that an organisation is unsuccessful, there will be other calls under different programmes. Um, for example, um, we have had a, a, a call for the Collaboration and Innovation Fund under the Pathways uh, to Success, the, the NEAT strategy from the Executive, uh, and a number of organisations who, who are maybe funded for one project on, under the European Social Fund will have sought uh, funds under that programme as well. So there are other funding sources out there, but for sure the European Social Fund is, is a major uh, commitment from the European Union to Northern Ireland, and in turn, it allows us uh, to create opportunities, whether it's in terms of apprenticeships, youth training, or on the inclusion, on social inclusion agenda. There's a wealth of opportunities out there for people. Well, Mr. Catherine Washington, for a question. I will ask you on question 11, please. Uh, I am saddened uh, by this closure and its impact on the employees of KPL. In order to support them at this time, my officials provided a redundancy advice service clinic on the 26th of February. Uh, this was carried out in partnership with a range of organisations, including the Social Security Agency, InvestNI, um, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, uh, Citizens Advice Bureau and the Career Service to offer a tailored package of support. Advice has been given on alternative job opportunities, mentoring, access to training courses, people starting their own business and careers advice, as well as a range of other issues such as benefits and taxation. In response to feedback from KPL employees who attended the clinic, my officials also ran a job club on the 16th of April in Dungiven to provide more intensive support and information to individuals in a small group setting. Uh, through my department's redundancy payment service, I am committed to providing an efficient, high-quality redundancy service to KPL staff who have an entitlement to statutory redundancy and meet the eligibility criteria uh, for payment from the National Insurance Fund's uh, statutory guarantee scheme. My officials are currently processing 160 uh, redundancy applications from, for from former KPL employees. Redundancy payments were issued to 126 former KPL employees on the 25th of April. Finally, I want to assure you that my staff and the local jobs and benefits uh, network will continue to deliver one-to-one -one support to those impacted. This includes a range of services, including assistance with job search, writing CVs, completion of job application forms, preparation for interviews, careers guidance or financial assistance with interview costs where necessary. Employees will also be offered full access to our programmes, including Steps to Work and the Youth Employment Scheme. Mr. Oshin for supplementary. The last kind of is going away is Danaira Asuf Danagrish, and I thank the Minister for his, uh, his answer and for the assistance that he has given to KPL. But does the Minister accept that in many cases those worst impacted by these recent closures, including KPLs, are not indeed even the staff but the subcontractors who, who stand to lose most? Uh, yes, I, I agree with the, the comments that the, the, uh, the member makes, and um, whether we're talking about this case or uh, other similar uh, tragic cases across uh, Northern Ireland in, in recent months, uh, there is a supply chain, and that uh, effects do, do filter down. Um, the services that we uh, offer in terms of the, the, the main employer, um, many of those are also available uh, to um, other employees who find themselves in, in that uh, situation. Uh, anyone uh, can call in, for example, to uh, the local job and benefit office and have a discussion uh, with a, a careers advisor, and we will signpost them to, to other uh, support um, where, where necessary. Uh, in, in particular, I would encourage uh, people who do find themselves in a redundancy situation to think carefully about their, their, their further options. 
Um, I am pleased that a number uh, of people who were made redundant from KPL have found alternative employment. And that does show the, the, the effectiveness at times of the, the, those clinics that we do uh, provide. Uh, in other cases, people will need to consider uh, opportunities for, for uh, retraining, and uh, our FE sector is there uh, as, a, as a ready resource uh, in that regard. And good career advice will signpost people to what is the most appropriate intervention. Order. That ends the period for oral questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Stuart Dixon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Minister, can you provide the House with an update on the consultation with regards to zero hours contracts in Northern Ireland? Uh, thank the member uh, for his question. Uh, I have made uh, clear, uh, both in the, in the Assembly and also to the Assembly uh, Committee, uh, that uh, I am committed to uh, undertaking a public consultation uh, on the potential regulation of uh, zero hours contracts uh, in Northern Ireland. It is my intention that that consultation uh, will be uh, released uh, before uh, the summer recess. In doing so, we are not seeking to necessarily ban uh, zero hours contracts, uh, in that we do recognise that they can offer flexibility for employers and also to a number uh, of em employees. But at the same time, uh, there is a significant uh, concern uh, around uh, their use and, moreover, their abuse, and uh, there the, the may well be a strong case uh, for a better regulation, and that the consultation uh, will seek uh, to, to bottom out th those considerations. It may be interesting to note that the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills in Great Britain recently concluded their own consultation on a number of aspects around zero hours contracts, and they received 37,000 responses, which gives an, idea, an indication of the degree of interest in this topic. Call Mr. Dixon for a supplementary. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Thank you, Minister. Minister, continuing on that theme with regards to uh, consultation, there was key research uh, published last week in uh, Britain. Can you comment on that and the effects that it will have on the consultation that you will undertake here? Well, the. the the situation uh, was that the research published last week um, gave a, uh, some, some figures, uh, some estimates on the numbers of uh, zero hours contracts being uh, deployed. Um, the estimate was about 1.4 million uh, live contracts. Uh, that doesn't count those uh, zero hours contracts which may be dormant. Uh, that was a, a higher figure than pre had previously been provided by either the Labour Force Survey or a, a CIPD, um, which were using uh, different uh, methodologies. Uh, we can extrapolate uh, from those figures uh, to Northern Ireland, and working on the basis uh, of uh, around about 4% uh, of employees being on zero hours contracts, that would equate to around uh, 28,000 here uh, in, in Northern Ireland. Given that we are talking about an extrapolation, that figure may be, be more, but it's more likely to be less, given the different structure of our economy. Um, I am committed to taking forward um, research specific to Northern Ireland, because it is important that we do uh, quantify uh, exactly what is going on within our own economy. And that will be a, a, a critical element uh, to any future policy development in this regard. We also know from the research in Great, in Great Britain uh, that zero hours contracts uh, tend to be more concentrated within some sectors than, than others, and health and social care is one uh, alongside tourism and hospitality. We also know that zero hours contracts tend to impact more on part time workers, more on, on women, and more on young people between 16 and, and 24. Again, those will, will all be considerations we will want to uh, confirm for Northern Ireland and also to factor into future policy development. Call Mr. Alex Maskey for a topical question. Mr. Can I ask the Minister for his assessment of the recent uh, Pound in Your Pocket survey carried out by the Students' Union NUS USI, a survey which revealed that almost one in five students, due to financial difficulties, are on the brink of actually dropping out of university? Well, I'm grateful uh, to the member uh, for, for raising that. Um, at times, uh, a lot of the public debate around student finance has focused, focused around the issue of uh, tuition fees. Uh, and while the issue of, of student debt um, is an important con consideration in terms of whether people uh, will uh, seek to progress to higher education uh, or not, and indeed we were right as an, as an executive and assembly uh, to freeze tuition fees for local students, we also have to take into account that there is a, a reality of how 
how students can live on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Um, we have our, our maintenance uh, support, um, uh, both in terms of loans and, and grants in that regard, but it is clear from the survey that there are students uh, who are uh, struggling in that regard. Uh, there are hardship funds that are available in the, the universities uh, which can be availed um, in, in, in some uh, circumstances, and certainly any student to find themselves in extreme situations should uh, talk to their, to, their, to their university in that regard. Uh, also, as part of the current uh, careers review, uh, I think one of the issues that we should consider is how we can um, better uh, pass on lessons in terms of sound uh, money management uh, to young people while they are still at school, and that may well be part of the wider careers advice that, that, that they receive. So there are a number of different avenues that we, that we can consider. For us, to, however, to increase the level of, of maintenance support, which I do uh, recognise as an option for us, that will in involve further commitment of resources, and that has to be taken in the round against the other potential uh, expenditure uh, and uh, costs that the executive may well be facing over the coming months and years. I call Mr. Maskey for supplementary. Well, I uh, can thank the minister for that response, and I know the minister has actually responded, in, at least in part to the supplementary, but the Student Union themselves have asked the Assembly to step up the levels of support we are currently giving to the students, and you have alluded to some aspects of that. Uh, could the Minister tell the House if he is in a position to further elaborate on the level of support being given or considered to be given, or would you might give a, maybe a more considered and formal <coughs> response to the Student Union about the support? Um, well, I, I did attend the uh, NUS uh, USI um, conference uh, last week, whenever that uh, report uh, was, was formally uh, uh, published, uh, and we're happy to engage uh, with NUS USI as a central organisation or with individual uh, students' unions uh, to discuss these issues in, great, in greater detail. The, the mechanism for taking this forward is that uh, we, we have currently commenced a review of, of student finance uh, within uh, the, the department. Um, I, I do want to stress that has, that hasn't stretched and will not stretch to the issue of tuition fees, which I do regard as being a settled point of policy across all of the main parties in this chamber. Um, but we are prepared to look at issues around uh, levels of, of maintenance support. But I do again stress that um, if we do feel that there is a case for increasing those, we will have to make a bid uh, to the executive uh, for additional resources, and that will have to be taken in the round by the executive uh, against all other pressures. Uh, Mr. Alistair Ross is not in his place. I call Mr. David McNary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, it is interesting that today we are debating under achievement of Protestant uh, working class boys. Uh, would the Minister accept that we need to embed greater technical education, engineering skills, computer program writing skills uh, far earlier for all in the current education process? Yeah, I, I would very much agree with the, what the member is saying. Um, it is important that we have a, a strong uh, pipeline of young people coming forward uh, with skills that are relevant uh, to the world of work uh, today. That includes both employability skills and the very particular technical skills that are, are required to fulfil a, a number of, of jobs. Um, we are looking at a number of interventions in terms of my own department, including the, the uh, review of apprenticeships. We also have a parallel review of, of youth training, uh, which will w want uh, to be aligned to the needs of the economy uh, as well. Um, we have also in initiated a, a joint review with the Department of Education of careers, and it is important that uh, we have a, a system that is very much tied uh, to the needs um, of, of the labour market. I think we need to drill, drill deeper, however, and to look at the reasons as to why uh, certain people are underachieving in terms of the education system. That is where important, it is important that we have uh, positive uh, role models. It is important that we give a, a sense of purpose as to why people will want to invest in, in certain skills and to give a, a, a sense of, of purpose and trajectory in terms of their employment uh, prospects. And we put that in, 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 in practical terms. Um, for example, if someone wants to work as, as a mechanic, uh, it is important um, that they do uh, attain their uh, GCSE in maths in order that they can function effectively in, in that uh, scenario. In an abstract sense, a young person may not understand the purpose of maths, but if they have an interest in cars and, and wish to be a mechanic, uh, we can create a, a virtual uh, loop back where they understand the reason for doing that. How we encompass all of this is through an overarching 14 to 19 strategy between my department and the Department of Education. That is something that is under discussion with the Minister of Education at present. 
call Mr McNary for a supplementary. I, I do thank the Minister for his positive uh, response and I'm very glad to hear that he, he agrees with me in the, mo in the most. Would he then accept that uh, dividing education as it is and skills into two departments is a major impediment to developing young people uh, for their future employment? Well, I don't think the, that necessarily uh, follows, so I, I would disappoint the member that probably we've reached the limit of, of, of where, we, where we're going to agree on that, on that particular point. Um, what, however, is important is that we do look to the future and appreciate that there may well be um, some reform of departments in, in due course. Um, we regard further education and higher education as being fundamental drivers of the economy and ideally sitting within a wider uh, department uh, of the economy uh, that properly integrates skills and research uh, with our uh, approach to developing business and attracting uh, further uh, in investment. Um, at present, um, there are protocols for uh, collaboration and cooperation between uh, my department and the Department of, Edu uh, of Education. Um, the, the FE sector uh, can work with schools as part uh, of, of area planning, uh, and it's important that we properly embed those, that, that collaboration within a wider 14 to 19 strategy. Call Mr. Phil Flanagan for a question. Mr. the last control, I want to, to re-explore the issue of removing barriers to north-south mobility at, at undergraduate level, and I want to see progress the, on this matter in time for this year's students. We don't want to see any more failed. Um, so, can I ask the minister whether, given the, the continuing difficulties in mobility and the small numbers of student flows, whether he would consider establishing a, a small team within his department, which could uh, manage a dedicated hotline focused on advising careers, teachers, students, and their parents? Um, who are seeking to explore the possibility of, student, of southern universities and um, answering specific questions on the CAO system? Yeah. Well, um, I am um, I mean, happy to, to reassure the member that we are giving this um, top uh, priority, not least because there is a, a financial um, rationale for doing so, in that um, given that the nature of flows are primarily from, from south to north uh, in terms of both further education and also higher education, um, that creates a financial pressure um, upon uh, our own uh, budgets. I think it's important that we encourage flows, uh, much greater flows in both directions um, on, on the island. I would, however, stress that the answer to the, the current problems probably lies more in the southern jurisdiction than it does here in Northern Ireland. Um, I probably hate to say to the member that at times the authorities in the south take a rather partitionist approach um, to education. <laughs> On, on, on the island of, of, of Ireland, uh, and um, for example, the issue around the, 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 the A-level equivalence has been one that both John O'Dowd and myself have been pushing uh, for a considerable number uh, of, of years. Um, there is no immediate sign of the overarching university authorities in the South um, showing flexibility in that regard. It's very much through the actions of individual uh, universities that we are making progress, but we need a, a wider policy uh, if we are to, to, to properly ensure that we have good, strong flows in both directions on the island. Call Mr Flanagan for supplementary, and I would encourage him to be brief. I'll ask Kun Kjolio, because um, I, I agree with the Minister that it is regrettable that, that some southern institutions take a, a partitionist approach. But the, the, one of the major problems we face in the north is access to accurate information and the fact that some careers teachers do not know how the CEA system works, the CEO system. So I would encourage the Minister to, to consider establishing a hotline which people could actually phone to get the information they need to allow them to make an informed choice about where they are going to go. On the specifics of what the member has said, can I assure him that uh, that is very much um, something that we will look at? Um, he will also be pleased to note that, uh, as part of the terms of reference uh, between my department and the Department of Education in relation to the joint review of careers, the issue of north south uh, student mobility is one of the specific areas that we have asked them to, to explore and examine, and we will expect recommendations in that regard later on this year. Question: uh, Lord Morrow has withdrawn his name. Mr. Copeland is not in his place. And I call Mr. Ian Millen. Last one, uh, Could I ask the minister? Uh, uh, can the minister uh, tell us uh, if he would join with me in congratulating the South West College, uh, which runs, which has five campuses across Throne and Fermanagh, and being ranked fourth out of all 350 further education colleges across Britain and in the north? Very good. 
Um, ab absolutely. Um, the, the South West College is a huge asset uh, to, to, to Northern Ireland, uh, and they are extremely well respected as an FE college um, throughout uh, th the, these islands. It is also worth, worth stressing that the college has recently uh, been uh, inspected and has received uh, top marks uh, in, in that regard, which is something virtually un unheard of. Uh, and it's, within that, it's, it's especially important to recognise that in reference to their, their, their training offer, they received a top score. And that particular aspect of the work of colleges is, is extremely rare that that accolade would be, would be passed on uh, to them. So we're very keen to actually uh, to, to learn wider lessons as to how the college has been so successful and to apply them across our wider uh, further education offer and also the, the current uh, review of youth training that we're undertaking. Order uh, time.